I would say, Lord, God of heaven, how would you have me to live this day? Direct my path. We observe that Jesus also lived a Holy Spirit-empowered life. He was baptized by the Spirit when he began his earthly ministry. He was led by the Spirit of the wilderness. He was full of the Spirit as he ministered. From beginning to end, Jesus Christ relied upon the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's the same Holy Spirit that we have indwelling us. And as Jesus was full of the Holy Spirit, the same word is used to tell us to be filled or be full, be controlled by the Holy Spirit. And then last week we noted that Jesus lived a life of cultivated intimacy with the Heavenly Father. He would frequently go away to a lonely place. He would step aside, be with God, not doing, simply being. And we ended last week with this challenge. The challenge was to invest four hours alone with the Lord. How'd it go? Some of you work, have some time, extended time with the Lord? Some of you tried? Huh? A couple of hands. Okay, you can show me your hands. Huh. You had a tough time with two. Well, that's a good start. So why would we not, as Christ followers, take some prolonged time to be with our God? Well, I'm really, really busy. I got a lot to do. But we might ask this question. In all your busyness, how much time did you spend watching television or a football game? How much time did you spend just doing frivolous things? So I think if we say, well, I didn't have the time, that's probably a kind of an excuse. They say, well, I don't really see the value of it. It's been resting. I have a friend a really good friend. We have been really good friends for over 47 years. And I really like to have time with her. It's not a burden. It's a pleasure. And we seem to find the time for those we really cherish in our life. So if I'm not investing some quality time with the Lord, maybe I need to think about my priorities a little bit. What's really important to me? It's one thing to say, oh, I love God on Sunday morning, but what about Monday through Saturday? These are questions for us to think about. Jesus lived a life of cultivated intimacy with his heavenly Father. And if he needed to step aside on a regular basis to do that, how much more do we need to do that. If we, James writes these words, if we are, um, if we hear the word and don't obey the word, we are deceiving ourselves. We need to understand that God's word in the life of Christ was not given to us to just kind of consider. It was given to us to alter how we live all the time being a Christ follower. Now this morning we'll look at another habit of Jesus and realize that Jesus lived his life as a servant. Have your Bibles turned to Mark chapter 10. In this Mark chapter 10, we have a very interesting little thing taking place here, and we see this happens many times with the disciples. Uh, they're walking along, and, and the disciples had this habit of kind of wanting to up one each other and to be more important than other people and they were vying for position and so they had some internal things going on and in John, Mark chapter 10 uh, they were 
James and John were asking for the uh, favor to sit at the right and left hand of Jesus in the kingdom. And then as the other ten heard this in verse 41 of Mark 10, the other became indignant with James and John. Who do they think they are anyway? How come they're trying to get a higher seat in the kingdom of God compared to us? And why are they having this intimate conversation with Jesus? And why are we left out? So Jesus observed this in Mark 10. Jesus called them to himself. Hey, guys, come here. Listen, you know, you know that those who are recognized as rulers of the, as recognized as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. But it's not so among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. Whoever wishes to be first among you shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to serve, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. In this passage, we observe this, is that um, God's great people serve others. That's the passage. What does it take to be a person, a Christ follower, that God says, yes, they, that's the kind of a person <laughs> that's great in my kingdom. He, he didn't down, put him down for wanting to be great. I mean, who wants to live an insignificant, meaningless life? Anybody heard of that? <laughs> like one of the old kings that he died to no one's regret. None of us desire for that. We desire to live a life that has some meaning, some significance, some purpose, some value. And that's what they hear. I want to live a life that it's a great life. And, and the Lord says, I'll tell you how to do this. The principle that's here is that God's great people serve others. We'll ask the question later on, who can be great in God's kingdom? And the answer is going to be everybody can because everybody can serve. Everybody can serve. And so we're going to see this when Jesus taught this. Um, was he saying, well, this is a good idea for you, but what about Jesus? And Jesus can say, listen, I am the model. Because not only did Jesus teach that God's great people serve others, he modeled this. The model of servanthood is the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's look at a couple passages that really bring this to the forefront. In John chapter 13, you know the story well. This is the upper room. It's towards the end of the life of Jesus' ministry. It's in the shadow of the cross as he had the last supper with him. And in 13, John, John 13 verse 1, Now before the feast of the Passover, Jesus, knowing this hour had come, he should depart out of this world. It would be a violent death, a painful death. Having loved his own or in the world, he loved them to the end. Got this picture. This is a moment of incredible anguish for the Lord Jesus. This is his last meal with his disciples. The next stop is the cross. Well, the garden and the cross. And so in the midst of all this <laughs> anguish and agony, during the supper, the devil having already put in the heart of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon Dream, Jesus, knowing the Father had given all things into his hands, he come forth from God, was going back to God, he rose from supper, laid aside his garments, and taking a towel, he girded himself. Then he poured water into the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel with which he was girded. That is a, a servant's role. If there was ever a time when Jesus should have been served, catered to, it was then. But Jesus, consistent with his entire lifestyle, took the basin of water and the towel and began to wash the disciples' feet. Remember back in Luke chapter 6, verse 40, 
said that a pupil is not above his teacher. When we're fully taught, we become like our teacher. Well, this is what he's teaching us. And so he girded himself up and began to wash the disciples' feet. And in verse 13, he goes on. He said this, you call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, Jesus said, but that's exactly what I am. If I then, the Lord and the teacher, wash your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. I give you an example that you should do as I did to you. There are some traditions, some churches who have taken this as for a, a, another sacrament that we ought to be washing feet as like we do the Lord's Supper. Most people have taken this to be no. The washing of the feet is simply an example of servanthood, an expression of the heart of Jesus that he came to seek and to serve. And so he modeled that. So Jesus said in Mark 10, my great people serve other people. Want to be great in God's kingdom? Serve. And Jesus said, and I, I'm your model. I am your example for doing that. He washed the disciples' feet. If you want to go to Philippians chapter 2, there's yet another reference that talks about this. Philippians chapter 2. Getting at verse 5. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped or held on to, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a bond servant. And being made in the likeness of man, being found in the appearance of being humbled himself, became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. The point is, he emptied himself, and he took on the form of a bond servant. When you're the son of God coming down to earth, being incarnated here, you can choose your lifestyle. And he chose in his love and mercy to be here as a servant. That's an amazing thing, isn't it? It's an amazing thing. You want to be a Christ follower? Part of being a Christ follower is having a father-directed life. Part of being a Christ follower is being controlled and filled with the Holy Spirit. Part of being a Christ follower is, is a nurtured intimacy with the Father. And part of being a Christ follower is being a servant. That's what Jesus did. That's what Jesus taught. That's what Jesus modeled. Now, it's interesting back in Mark chapter 10. I always like this little sequence here because in Mark chapter 10, verse 41 to 42, it's like Jesus saying, here's the principle. Here's, the prin here's, what, here's what I'm teaching you to do. If you want to be great in my kingdom, then serve other people. So between Mark 10.45 and 10.46, there's some time that passes. But Mark placed these two things side by side, I think, to give us the principle in verses 42 to 43, 45, that God's great people serve others. And then, that's as they were coming into Jericho. Then they were going out of Jericho. And here is, a, by the side of the road, a blind beggar named Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the road. And when he heard that Jesus was Nazarene was passing him by, he began to cry out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And by the way, that name, Jesus, son of David, that is a declaration of this man's belief that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. It's a profession of faith. It was promised in the Old Testament that the Messiah would be the seed of David. And to believe that this Jesus was that seed of David was a declaration of this man's faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. He is believing he hasn't seen with his eyes, but he's heard, and somehow he knows. So he cries out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And some people are saying, shut up. Well, it says in 48, they were sternly telling him to be quiet. But that's what it means. Shut up. Don't bother him. But Jesus stopped and said, call him here. And they called the blind man saying, well, what a day this was for him, huh? Take courage. He's calling for you. Casting aside his cloak, he jumped up and came to Jesus. And Jesus said, 
what do you want me to do for you? What may I do for you? That is the servant's question. What may I do for you? And if Jesus asked that, I think it's simply a, a demonstration of modeling here of what Jesus would have us to ask of each other. What may I do for you? And then doing it. That's a very simple question, isn't it? Think how revolutionary this is for a lifestyle. What if in your household, when you woke up, that either in your mind or on your lips were the words, what may I do for you today? What may I do for you today? And you follow through by doing it. You see, this servant gets practice in the, in the everyday life. And Jesus' everyday life was walking along. He saw this blind beggar, Bartimaeus, and what may I do for you? <laughs> How may I help you? And he did it. God's great people serve others. Jesus modeled that. And he gave us a very simple little question to help us move along in the process. Now, we need to ask a question here because the question is, whom do we serve? Whom do we serve? And it's very important for us to keep in mind that ultimately it's the Lord Jesus Christ and we serve him by serving his people. But he is the one that we're serving. He is the ultimate one that we're coming before as a servant. What may I do for you? How may I serve you? And we do this by serving his people. Think about that perspective. If you think about Matthew 25, where it's in a judgment scene, and Jesus is saying to the people uh, that come before him being judged, and Jesus said, you know, I was hungry and you fed me. I was naked and you clothed me. And I was in prison, you came to visit me. And I was sick and you came and cared for me. And they said, oh, wait a minute. When did we do that? And then Jesus said, if you did it from the least of mine, you've done it for me. Can we have that picture in mind as we respond to fellow Christians that we are not serving just them? but we're serving Jesus. They represent Jesus to us. What a vision. It makes it all. And in that judgment scene in Matthew 25, this is, this is part of what is important to God. It's important to us. So I need to keep in mind is that, yeah, God has called me and called you as a Christ follower to be a servant to one another. And we are serving the Lord Jesus Christ by serving his people. Becoming a slave, if you will. Now, the question comes, well, wait a minute. Is, is serving like being a doormat? If I'm to serve you, does that mean whatever you demand or ask or tell me to do, I'm supposed to do that? That's one of the excuses people use. Well, I don't think the servant idea works very well because you become just used by people. But... Is being a servant being a dormant? And the answer is no, it is not. Because why? Because a true serving person does what is best for a person with the resources one has. And oftentimes, it is not doing what someone wants us to do that serves them best. I've shared this story before, but we had a incident. We had a, a man that went to the church we attended down in Dallas, Texas. And uh, he, he was always, always, always short of money. Just his habit of life. But he had money for some other things that we didn't consider important. So the church board had given him lots of money throughout the, the time he was there. One day they said, you know, this is not really serving him. He really needs to learn to have a budget. He really needs to learn how to take care of his money. And I remember the church board made that decision, and I remember he got mad and left. Didn't get his way. And I remember so clearly 
We used to have agape dinners. They were like communion table times around a meal. And uh, he showed up a couple years down the road. He said, you know, I came to thank you for what you did. I was upset. I, was, I didn't get what I wanted, but I got what I needed. We really served him. The church really served him by doing that. Serving is not giving people everything they want. Little children tend to have a great appetite for candy, right? So little kid says, you know, hey, give me my candy. <laughs> no. No. We don't serve our children by giving them all the candy they want. We don't serve each other by giving others all the candy. But it's taking God, what do you want, what's best for the person with the resources that I have. Now, this is going to tie back now, if you think about if I have a father-directed life, controlled by the Holy Spirit, living with a nurtured closeness to God, that informs how we then will serve. Because as we walk in a close intimacy with God, what happens with that? Part of what happens is, as we walk close with God, we become more like him, become more discerning and more wise, and are able to make good decisions. As we serve, we're empowered by the Spirit to keep on doing that kind of service. Are we tracking together? These are not isolated habits that Jesus had. They integrate together. And the wise servant is not serving at the whim of the people. The wise servant is serving as God directs, as God empowers with the resources that God has given. And by God's great design, I'm sure, he has not given us the ability to minister to everybody, to address all their needs. We all have gifts, talents, abilities, resources that can be used to serve, but we do it differently. A couple of questions to ponder. There are two kingdoms God talks about in the Bible. There's the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan. And every single person on the face of the earth is under one of those two realms. Now we say, well, I want to be great in God's kingdom. I want to be great. Who can be great in God's kingdom? The answer is, Everybody can be great in God's kingdom, right? Because every single one of us has some capacity and some way to serve. We don't fault someone for not giving a lot of money if they're broke to other people, right? We're responsible for what God has given to us, the resource, whether it's monetary or time or ability to listen or to speak or to help, whatever the case may be. But we can all take what God has given to us and we can use it. And everyone can be great in God's kingdom. It's not a comparative thing. Well, he serves better than so-and-so serves. It's not about that. The question, what am I doing with the resources that I have at my life stage? I'm old and retired. I'm young and in high school. I'm a middle-aged person. I'm Wherever I am in life, say, what resources do I have? And when I use those resources, will they be available for God to use to serve each people? And if we use the resources God has given to us to serve, God says, you're a great man, you're a great woman. Does it say greater or lesser than someone else, you're just a great person. Questions to ponder. There's two kingdoms. Two kingdoms, kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan. That's all there is. And all of us, we are living under the directions and the authority of one of those two kingdoms. We can be a person who by, by God we've been transferred, the kingdom of darkness, Colossians 1 says, as we believe in Christ, we're transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of God's dear son. We have a new, we're living in a new kingdom with a new king as Christ's followers. But we can still be influenced by the kingdom of darkness. 
and by the values of that kingdom. We have to ask the question, the question we're pondering is this, what kingdom values are we embracing? What kingdom values are we embracing? Jesus said in Mark chapter 10 that in the world, that would be in the kingdom of darkness, their, their important people lord it over other people. They control people. But in my kingdom, Jesus said, my great people serve others. Whose kingdom values are you embracing? What king are you following after? What king is being allowed to dictate in my mind what's really important, what really matters? The Lord has taught us, in my kingdom, my great people serve other people. And you can be a part of that. We need to ask the question, by God's grace, will you cultivate asking the servant's question, what may I do for you? What may I, and then follow through by doing it. Being a Christian and a Christ follower is not all that difficult. We sometimes seem to come across like it takes a lot of wisdom or a lot of smarts or whatever, you know, to do something. It doesn't. Every single Christ follower can be great in God's kingdom because every single one of us in some way can serve. I can't serve like you can serve. You can't serve like I can serve. We serve differently. But it's not about the, what we do, but it's about being available to serve God, to serve his people. Great in God's kingdom. On the back of your sermon notes today, there's a, a little chart that may be helpful to you. And just kind of put things in perspective. You know, wh whose kingdom, whose values am I really embracing? And on the back it has a, a two little boxes, Satan's kingdom and God's kingdom. And look at the contrast. In Satan's kingdom, the accent is on the externals. How do I look? How do I compare to the people? In God's kingdom, it's all about the heart. What's in your heart? In Satan's kingdom, there's great value placed on material wealth. In God's kingdom, it's the values of the state of the heart that's important. In Satan's kingdom, leaders control. They have power over. In God's kingdom, leaders serve. In Satan's kingdom, <laughs> often the issue is being right. By this, I mean having my own way and getting you to agree with me. In God's kingdom, praying and put on truth. In Satan's kingdom, it's my glory, my honor, my reputation. It's all about me. In God's kingdom, it's God's glory. Satan's kingdom, it's being on top. It's winning, being first. In God's kingdom, it's being faithful. That's a contrast. So as we step back, you know, to walk in your shoes, Jesus. How would you live your life in, in my shoes? And you're saying, I would live your life by using what I have to serve others. And that makes us great in God's kingdom. So that's not hard, is it? Well, the theory is not hard. The practice may be more challenging for us. But I rejoice. I hope you do. That I don't have to do what somebody else does. I don't have to measure up to some other person's what they can do. I can simply take the resources, the talents, the gifts, whatever I have, and I can use it to serve other people in Jesus' name. And the Lord says, that's good. You're a great man. You're a great woman when you serve other people in that fashion.
So, are you ready to do that? Well, you're going to need to be directed by the Father, like Jesus was, to be a really good servant. You're going to need to be empowered by the Holy Spirit, like Jesus was, to be a really good servant. You're going to have to nurture intimacy with God to make wise, discerning decisions, to know how best to serve. They all thought together. How would Jesus live our lives in our shoes? He would live it being directed by the Father, empowered by the Spirit, cultivate intimacy with the Father, and serving. And it's all doable. So, Father, we pray you will write these words upon our heart. We find ourselves sometimes singing about you, Jesus. I want to be like Jesus. I want to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. But now in a place, say, really? Lord, I would pray you give all of us the desire and the grace to want to live the way Jesus would live in our shoes and to live it out in his sweet name. Amen. We're going to sing a little song that uh, it's a prayer, actually. Make me a servant, humble and meek. Lord, let me lift up those who are weak. And may the prayer of my heart always be, make me a servant, make me a servant, make me a servant today, right now. It's a prayer. It's a song, but it's a prayer. It's addressed to God. Would you shape me in this way? Lord God, would you make me a servant? Let's remain seated as we sing this to the Lord. And maybe the prayer is, well, I kind of would like to be there, but I'm not there. God starts with us where we are and goes from there. I mean, I say to you that if you're here this morning, you've not believed in Jesus Christ as your Savior, none of this makes any sense at all because you're in the kingdom of darkness. Only by faith and trust in Jesus Christ are we transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of God's dear Son. But when we believe in Jesus Christ, we're placed in God's kingdom. And in God's kingdom, we have freedom of choice. And we can choose to live by the old values of the kingdom of darkness and by the grace of God, we can choose to live as defined by him. And if we're there, then we can say, Lord, maybe it doesn't mean I am a servant, make me a servant. Teach me to walk in Jesus' steps, to live and serve as he did. Let's sing together.